Luigi Zingales, my conversant, is one of the best and best known economists, both in the United States and in Europe. He's written three best selling books, the most recent of which just came out in Italian. It's called Europe or Now. A Capitalism for the People from three years ago is, in my view, perhaps the best book on the current American economy and what's wrong with it and what should be done. And with Raghu Rajan, he has an earlier book, Saving Capitalism from the Capitalists. Luigi's contributions are far ranging. He's been at the Graduate School of Business of University of Chicago for now, I think, 27 years. He is a major contributor to theory of the firm, politics, culture, governance. This is just a small sliver of the papers he has written in addition to the three books. He is now the director of the Stigler Center at the University of Chicago. Most of all, in recent times, Luigi has been known for his biting critique of what we all sometimes call crony capitalism. There's more I could say, but let's get to the dialogue. Now, I, I think of a lot of your work as bringing the ideas of culture and governance into economics. And there's, there's a few major strands in your thought, and I want to explore a few of them. But since you're Italian, uh, let's start with the question of Italy. If you look at the economic performance of Italy, uh, it's, the country is just coming out of a triple dip recession, right? Unemployment's about 12%. By some measures I've seen, per capita income is not higher than what it was 15 years ago. And they're over 2 trillion euros in debt. Some serious problems and a low birth rate. How do you see this playing itself out? And what, what is the end game? How pessimistic or optimistic are you? I think that you said correctly, it's not just the fact we're coming out from a triple recession, it's the fact that uh, Italy did not grow for the last 20 years. And uh, in, um, there are a lot of things that don't go well in Italy, uh, but uh, when I left uh, 27 years ago, uh, a lot of things were not working and Italy was growing. In fact, uh, in the period 1945 to 1995, Italy grew at a rate that was at least as good, if not better, than Europe and the United States, and especially in terms of productivity. And uh, since 1995, Italy stopped growing in terms of productivity. And of course, if you don't grow in terms of productivity, you don't, don't grow in terms of income per capita, and so on and so forth. And uh, the question of why, I think, is one of the most uh, important questions, not just for the future of Italy, but for the future of the Europe, of Europe in, ge in general. And, uh, I, with, with a, uh, a co-author, I have tried to analyze uh, the values theories because uh, one theory which is very popular, particularly in Italy, is that uh, it's all fault of the euro. Uh, because it is true that uh, this uh, uh, sort of sudden stop happened roughly at the time Italy joined the euro. Um, I don't think there is any evidence that that's the case in spite of the fact that there is a very strong correlation temporally. Uh, I think that the sad reality is that the institutional uh, deficit present in Italy are particularly severe as you approach the technological frontier. So if you have um, institutions that don't work, that are corrupt, and etc., cetera, um, you can get by if uh, the only thing you have to do is uh, improve uh, agriculture and produce T-shirts. And uh, we've seen sort of... Uh, uh, Cambodia, not a great institution, but they produce great t-shirts and uh, it works. Um, once you try to compete in the first league, when you try to uh, be at the frontier of the technology, you need to have a relatively non-corrupt government, uh, a system where people pay taxes uh, without too much tax evasion, but not too, too much taxes because otherwise they don't produce and so on and so forth. And uh, Italy has failed, in my view, to do that. And uh, I think that uh, the new government by Renzi is trying to do this. Um, uh, the Jew is still out whether it will succeed. When I hear other people speak about Italy, there's a certain tension as to how long these cultural effects last. So you read Robert Putnam. Things matter from hundreds of years ago. In some of your papers, it matters how many years a region had as an independent city-state. It matters whether, I think in the year 1000, whether you had a medieval bishop mm -hmm. in your city. So those are very durable cultural effects. But I, I think back to being in Italy in the 1980s, mid-1980s, when it passed the UK in terms of per capita income. It was, in a sense, then at the European frontier and still growing. 
And now it's not so much later, and what feels like the same culture seems to be giving very different results. And how, how's the way we make sense of that? Uh, two things. First of all, uh, the, the distinction that uh, Patnan makes and a lot of people make about the, the North and the South. Uh, I think in some senses disappearing in Italy, but in the, in the worst direction, says all Italy is looking more like the South. So uh, the North, <laughs> the, the Northern <clears throat> people, and I come from the North, even if my grandfather came from the south, but as, as I came from the no north, and people in the north, when I go back home, they still feel like very proud that I'm much better than people in the south. And I say, you know, when you're in the Titanic, being on the third deck or the first deck, doesn't make a huge difference. Yeah, you are on the third deck is better than the first, because you just sink a little bit later, but you still sink. And I think that uh, uh, there is this arrogance in the north that uh, I don't think is fully justified, because many of the bad practices of the south have been imported in the north. Uh, so the mafia used to be only in Sicily. Today is present in Milan, is present in, in Venice, is present everywhere. So I think that, that when, you, when uh, we are questioning what has got, gotten worse, I think there is this component. And the second is uh, the boom, what people did not fully realize, but the boom of Italy in the 1980s was a boom of a developing country that had a protected currency area. And this is, we were playing the uh, catch-up nation within Europe. And while everybody else in Europe was moving in more advanced sort of production and services, et cetera, they were leaving behind market space for us to capture the sort of uh, less technological uh, productions. And we did it with gusto. And so it was a boom in the 80s, but it was a boom in the wrong direction. Let's, let's say we go back to 1860. Was Verity wrong? Say Italy had not become a single nation. There had been a north and a south, or even half a dozen or more nations competing against each other, or more of a Swiss model. Was the nationalist model for Italy a mistake? This is a very hard question, but let me try to, to say that what I think was wrong is uh, precipitating uh, the uh, unification without really a uh, national culture. Uh, it, there was a small elite that felt Italian, uh, but uh, the rest of the population did not felt Italian. And so uh, a number of accidents, including the heroism of the only Italian who actually was a, a military leader, Garibaldi, uh, made uh, unification possible against all odds. And it says, I, I'm sure that had you asked people in 1858, what are the chances that within three decades Italy get unified? They would say one out of 100. And uh, within two years was unified most of it. Uh, so uh, it was really a, a chance. Uh, but then, uh, because this happened before there was like a, a, a national spirit, uh, it turned out it was basically an agonization of the South by the North, in which the North imposed uh, its laws to the South, um, and they were not good for the South. And one of the uh, best Italian thinkers and most unknown is uh, this guy, Vincenzo Cuoco, who was part of the Napolitan Revolution in 1799 and was uh, actually convicted to death to participate in this revolution. This revolution, for people who are not familiar with Italian history, was a Jacobin revolution trying to imitate what they were doing in Paris, in Naples. And uh, this revolution initially succeeded. And then uh, a cardinal brought some uh, troops from the south of uh, a very simple peasant that massacred sort of uh, this, uh, the, the uh, Napolitan's elite and brought back uh, the uh, sort of uh, the, the ancien regime. And then they, of course, went back and forth with Murat, et cetera. But the interesting thing about this guy is that after he was convicted uh, to death and then sort of uh, uh, got uh, escaped, uh, wrote a history about that revolution. And he's probably the only person who wrote an history of something that he lived in and gave an interpretation that is valid to this day. And his interpretation is, you can't export other models in different contexts. The uh, Napolitans who try to copy France are silly because they don't understand the social, cultural, economic context of France 
at that time was completely different than one of Naples. And he has this analogy, say, every place has its own uh, cloth. And uh, you are not going to put like uh, Finnish cloth to a Greek or Greek cloth to a Finnish because you're going to either sort of uh, sweat to death or, or, or sort of uh, uh, be freezing. So why do we want to impose the same rules to everybody? And uh, Italy tried to do this, and the result was that in the South, a complete rejection of the northern model, uh, so much so that there was a revolt that uh, we in history call bandits, but in reality was a liberation front that just lost, and uh, when you lose, you're always on the wrong side, and so it's called sort of uh, bandits. But uh, uh, the North did not need this. The South uh, had this revolt, and then they reached a, a, a compromise there was a compromise, um, not unlike, I think, what happened in the South and the United States. It was for the wars of both sides, in the sense that uh, the North side uh, agreed with the uh, big uh, uh, landowner of the South that uh, we leave them in power in exchange for consensus, and they will retain their power in exchange for an army that defends their land against uh, the revolt of the people. And, and that led the South to underdevelopment for years. And since very few people know that when Italy got unified, the income per capita of Sicily and the one of Emilia Romagna around Bologna were the same. And today is almost double the one of Emilia Romagna versus Sicily. So it's a huge sort of, uh, 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 sort of gap. Now, why I insist so much on this? Because I think there is an analogy that most people don't fully appreciate between the Italian unification and the European unification. Um, Europe got unified roughly in the same way. There was a small elite that felt European. Uh, most people uh, don't really feel European, uh, but uh, a small elite uh, feel European. They speak uh, the same language, which happens to be English. Uh, pretty soon, sort of, uh, England will be out of the Europe, so they speak <laughs> but they feel part of the same nation. Uh, they, they talk, they go to the same meetings, etc., etc. And they are trying to force unification over sort of the desire of people. And the result, I think, is not working very well. And uh, in the old days, you were sending sort of uh, troops to maintain the South uh, under order. Now you use the central bank, or you use sort of a, but uh, it's not that different. At the end of the day, what I fear is a desertification of the southern part of Europe, similar to what uh, happened in the southern part of Italy. Like a deindustrialization. One of my favorite papers by you is your paper with Bruno Pellegrino. That's a great name for co authoring a paper on Italy. <laughs> and the, the way I read that paper is you're saying something like this Italy right now doesn't have enough firms which could be five or ten times larger than they currently are. And the global economy over the last 20 years has put greater emphasis on scaling up. The 1980s were much less about scaling up. You could do better with small to medium sized enterprises in the 1980s. But now everything's about scaling up. You have Apple, you have Google, kind of mega scale. So Italy more or less has stayed still. China has scaled up. And in the new world where scaling up is really what matters, Italy is left behind. And that's the fundamental productivity reason why even the Italian North hasn't in some ways done that well. I mean, is that the way you think about it? Or? Absolutely, but it's not just the apple of this world. Um, it's also the Starbucks. It says, if there is one thing Italy is competitive on and is better than everybody else, is food. Okay? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the fact that the major chain of coffee uh, is not Italian is really hurtful. And it says, I understand, <laughs> no, I understand that uh, Apple is an American product, okay? But when I arrived in this country 27 years ago, you were not really drinking coffee. You were drinking like a dark thing that tastes like, I don't say what, because we're online, okay? So the, the culture of coffee did not exist here. And uh, the culture of uh, coffee and a cafe where you sort of sit and drink, etc. what Starbucks is, is a Italian or at most French culture. And, why you were unable to export this? And uh, this is my, my little uh, explanation. Um, if you go to an Italian coffee, by the way, the only country in the world where Starbucks has not arrived is Italy, OK? Uh, <laughs> and uh, so if you go to an Italian coffee shop, uh, the productivity of the individual working there is five times the one of Starbucks. 
Uh, they do coffee, cappuccino, one after the other, no question asked. Uh, they understand five orders contemporaneously. You come here to the United States, you first go to the cashier, you have to repeat five times what you want, <laughs> then another will repeat five times to the one producing it, and then five times to the one delivering it. It's sort of, it's like, how can Starbucks compete? And the answer is very simple, because uh, the bar, the, the Italian cafe, are one shop, one establishment thing. If you go to a cafe, you're going to find that at the register, there is an old woman who is generally the owner. And she watches over everything. Why? So you can't scale monitoring. Exactly. But why? Because the model they're do doing allows people to steal whatever they want. Because uh, you take money here, you use coffee all over the place, you have no monitoring of how much coffee is consumed, how much revenue are produced. If you don't have the lady checking you out throughout the day, at the end of the day, there's zero revenues and all cost. Okay? Um, in Starbucks, everything is computerized. Uh, so you know at the end of the day how many coffee you have to have and how much, uh, how many, much RAM you have to have, how much coffee you have consumed. You can actually order coffee online uh, automatically because everything is centralized in Seattle. So you can scale it. So in uh, the extreme agency problems of Italy, makes it difficult to scale firms. So either you have family firms in which you have all the employees that are part of the family, and it's not obvious that family does not steal, but still, uh, less so. Uh, and <laughs> at least oh, they're stealing from themselves, <laughs> Exactly. <right? laughs> at least there is some redistribution internally. Or at the end of the day, you can scale these things up. I think that's, that's a huge problem. Here's an article from Quartz. Let me read you the headline. Maybe you saw it from a few months ago. The most common surnames of new entrepreneurs in Italy are Hu, H-U, Chen, and Sing. And if you look at Milan, you have to go through 20 names, and at number 20 is the Italian name Colombo for the most common or most frequent names of entrepreneurs. Is this sustainable culturally, or is this Italy's future, in essence, to be economically colonized the way parts of Southeast Asia have been by Chinese, Indian, Sikhs, whoever it may be, maybe Germans? So one friend of mine was saying that the demise of the Italian uh, uh, firm family structure is the demise of the Italian family. Uh, and it says, when you used to have seven kids, one out of seven in the family was smart. You could find it, right? <laughs> so you could transfer the family, the, the business within the family with a little bit of meritocracy and selection. Uh, when you're down to one or two kids, uh, the chances that one is an idiot and uh, uh, is, is pretty large. And so the result is that you can't really transfer the business within the family. And uh, so that's a, the, the biggest problem of Italy is actually fertility, in my view. Because we don't have enough kids. And if you don't have enough kids, you don't have enough people to transfer. You don't have enough young people to be dynamic. So the, the Italian culture has a lot of defects, but the entrepreneurship uh, culture was there, has been there, and it still is there. But uh, we don't have enough young people. And uh, uh, now, uh, what uh, the Chinese are doing are taking over mostly sort of the bars, the, the restaurants, the, the small uh, uh, things uh, initially, because those are the easier one to enter. And, uh, and they are many, and they are very dynamic. And so I think that that's, uh, that's exactly the, the Italian problem. So p paint a picture for me here of the end game. 30 years from now, typical Italian family has 1.3 kids, debt to GDP ratio, at least as reported, at about 130%, mm -hmm. second highest in the Eurozone after Greece, productivity problems. 30 years from now, what do you predict? What are we going to see? Um, you know, uh, it's difficult to predict, especially the future, right? Yes. Uh, I think that uh, uh, my view is, one thing I, I can predict fairly confidently is that we are not going to pay the debt. Uh, so there will be some form <laughs> of uh, uh, external redistribution. <laughs> No, unfortunately, uh, we missed the right moment. There was a moment in which 50% of the debt was owned by foreigners, and uh, uh, the Germans made sure that we bought it all back. That was part of the, of the system. Uh, and, and now, uh, I think it's 70% uh, owned by Italians, so it's mostly redistribution. Uh, but I think that uh, it's very hard to imagine that uh, we can sustain this level of debt. I think that uh, the combination between uh, lack of fertility uh, lack of productivity growth, and not particularly law for immigration, 
uh, makes uh, sort of uh, demography being the number one consideration. And uh, I've said, said this like uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, of course, nobody wants to talk about these things, uh, but it's inevitable. Let me try giving you an optimistic case for Italy, and you tell me if you buy it or not. If you look at debt to income for Italy, it does look horrible, it is horrible. But if you look at debt to wealth of the Eurozone nations, the ratio of wealth to income in Italy is quite high, as you know. A very high percentage of Italian families simply own their houses outright. Mm -hmm. Private debt is pretty low, right? Traditionally, a lot of the banks have been in okay shape. So it could be when you think about Italian debt relative to wealth, it's only an extraction or a political economy problem. Who is going to pay? Who is going to pick up the bill on the table of the restaurant? Of course, all the Italians are waiting. But when the time comes and things are truly desperate, Italy has often done best in desperate times. And the wealth is there to pay off the debt. Everyone's simply playing a postponing game. True or false? I think it's false. The only thing that I agree is that the Italians give the best in the worst times. I think that that's definitely the case. Um, however, uh, I'm surprised that you don't think there are significant that way cost of taxation and with distribution. So, uh, and uh, it, especially within a more mobile world, sure. this is becoming very serious. You mentioned correctly houses, though that's the only stuff that uh, mm -hmm. cannot run away. Okay, uh, people run away, uh, financial capital runs away, uh, houses don't run away. Sure. Okay, so first of all. Uh, it, Italians are taxed very little on houses today, and the first m m decision that Renzi has made is to detax houses completely. Yes, I know. Okay, so <laughs> it's going completely in the wrong direction. Okay, why? Because it's extremely unpopular. It's, of course, it's, if seventy percent of people own houses, then it's hard to, to tax houses. Uh, and honestly, if you were to do a wealth tax on houses, uh, the value of houses would go down because people are very illiquid, and so it would go down. Now, how can you tax a lot other stuff? Labor leaves. I'm an example of that. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, there is an, an increasing number of people leaving. So when I left Italy, very few people were leaving at that time. Today, uh, it's hard to find people of uh, the younger generation not leaving. It's really sort of a, a, a major migration that, by the way, uh, decrease the human capital. Because now, what, who are leaving? Italy is in the business of exporting high human capital people and importing low human capital people. So it's not a good trade. Okay? And, and as long as you are in the European Union, even financial mobility is high. It's like mm -hmm. saying, uh, uh, unfortunately, I always choose the wrong places because I live in <laughs> Illinois. Uh, Illinois. Is, not dif that Chicago. different from Italy. Well, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, I always say that the, the thing that makes me feel at home in Illinois is Chicago politics. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, if you try to fix the Illinois budget and etc., it's very hard to increase taxes because people move to Indiana or Michigan or Wisconsin in a second, right? So, uh, the, we can discuss how big is the Laffer curve at the national level, but at the state level, is very elastic. And it used to be that in Italy was not the case. But what the European Union has done is to basically eliminate this bias. And people, I grew up in, in Veneto, which is not far from Austria and Slovenia. People move to Austria and Slovenia anytime. And why do you want to stay in Italy where you tax more, things work less well, et cetera, et cetera? So the elasticity is very large. And so if you try to catch up in that game, I think that uh, you're going to lose. Let's try the United States for a while. <laughs> a lot of us have been very struck by a piece you wrote in 2011. I think it was for City Journal. And this was a piece about Donald Trump. And you basically said in this piece, Donald Trump is for real or could be for real. We should be very grateful that he has decided not to run for president. This is 2011, <laughs> not 2015. Now, you're Italian. Quarter Sicilian, I'm told. And you've lived here now, not here, you've lived in Illinois <laughs> for 27 years. But what is it you see about us that we don't? You know, you're kind of Tocqueville of Italy. <laughs> A lot of your papers are on the United States. What's the insight into us that you get and we lack? Uh, let me start with uh, the analogy between uh, uh, Trump and Berlusconi, because I think that they are very similar in every dimension. In a sense, they are both uh, extremely good salesmen. Uh, 
They are both uh, extremely wealthy and uh, not afraid to show uh, off their wealth. Uh, they are both obsessed with women. Uh, they are both obsessed with air or lack of air for Berlusconi. They both <laughs> profess themselves as uh, free marketeers, but they both made their money in businesses that are the ultimate uh, opposite of free markets. And this is real estate uh, and gambling versus real estate and, and TV that is basically a regulated utility in Italy. These are sort of, a, you make money by having the right connection with government. And uh, so that's their version of free market. But they're both <coughs> extremely good, and this is the success of Berlusconi and the success of Trump, uh, in portraying themselves as friend of the people. Uh, why? In part is because they speak uh, at a very low level, so um, people identify with them, and, uh, and they are happy to identify because say, e even somebody that uh, is so uh, sort of crass like Berlusconi can become rich. Maybe I can make it too. So that, that's self-identification is very important. Um, but the, the most important thing that, uh, and this is coming to my advantage, having seen uh, what Berlusconi represented for Italy, I became much more concerned about what the United States are becoming. So my favorite line is that uh, the great contribution of Berlusconi to humankind is that made things transparent. So um, Berlusconi is the integrated version of the US Congress. In what sense? In, in the US Congress, you have people that uh, were lobbies before, they become congressmen, and then they go back to lobby. Uh, but at least until they're congressmen or secretary of treasury, etc., they don't, are not employee of somebody. Now, they're beholden to somebody because they come there, they go there, but at the moment, there is a little bit of appearance of separation. Berlusconi did not even care about the appearance, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Everything was integrated, his own employee, so he ran a party with his own employee. Uh, he created the party, it was a fantastic, from a, from a sort of strategic point of view, in three months he created the party. And he was sending his ad agent guy being the party leaders all over the place. Um, the same people became then his member of parliament, uh, the other were his personal lawyer, uh, his personal something else, and, and so on. They became sort of a member of parliament, ministries. So uh, you had the Minister of Telecommunication that was the employee of Berlusconi deciding on rules on telecommunication that affected Berlusconi. So are you so, saying that we here are more corrupt than we think? And that Berlusconi is a kind of mirror on us and you have better access to that mirror and so through that mirror you understand America and its crony capitalism in some ways better than we do? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that strikes me about the literature on corruption and rent-seeking and political influence is what is sometimes here called the Tulloch paradox. Gordon Tulloch you know, worked in this building. And Tulloch raised the question of, given how much is at stake in politics? In the US, it's about 40% of GDP. In Europe, it may be above 50% of GDP. Tulloch was actually surprised, in a way, relative to that, how little was spent on lobbying. So for him, there's some kind of structural barrier story. But what's your take on the Tulloch paradox? Why aren't we even more corrupt yet, given what percent of GDP in this country is allocated through mechanisms of a, a mix of force and democratic, whatever you want to call it, rather than voluntary exchange? Yeah, for, first of all, let, let me spend the word to praise Gordon Tulloch. Uh, I'm very sorry he passed away recently, and I'm even more sorry that he didn't, wasn't celebrated the way he deserved to be celebrated. In, in my view, he was an extremely insightful economist, uh, who made the point of uh, there is not enough money in politics in 1972, if I'm, uh, I'm not mistaken. A long time ago, yeah. A long time ago, at a time where there was much less money in politics. So, first of all, he got clearly the derivative right, because from 1972 <laughs> to today, the amount of money in politics exploded. So, I think he was very far-sighted in understanding this. The second is, in my view, the reason why we don't see enough money is, is twofold. Number one, uh, there is ideology, uh, so you can't really pay everybody, but people have some preferences, especially when they're not paid a lot, uh, for some position. And so that decreases the power of, of money. But the most important fact mm -hmm. is that 
Some people find it very easy to collect the money, which are vested interests. They organize because they're small. This is Manco Olson. They organize much faster. They can collect the money uh, faster. In uh, the public at large, find it difficult to collect the money. So uh, the, the paradox of Taluk, the way I like to describe it, the Gordon, uh, Gordon Taluk paradox is, is the following. Imagine you have some lottery tickets in which, unlike most lottery, in which the state gets most of it, uh, is pure sort of uh, actuarially fair. So uh, you know that uh, you are going to buy, uh, let's say, uh, $5 trillion is the payoff, and you start to, uh, to sell the tickets. You know that by buying all the tickets, for sure, you're going to get $5 trillion. So it seems that why the collective amount of tickets doesn't sell for $5 trillion. Sure. And that's basically what Talak is saying. He's saying, why, if we are purely cynical and we try to buy all the votes, uh, if you buy all the votes in Congress and for president, you get to allocate a lot of goodies. So that, that value, the value of the votes collected it should be at least the value of the rents you get on all the goodies you allocate, uh, which uh, we can discuss how much it is, but it's on the order of trillions of dollars. Okay? So the point is that uh, the public at large is not able to coordinate and bid very much for those votes. So those go votes sell cheap. Uh, why they sell cheap? Because the party are not well organized. Now, since the time of Gordon Tallow to today, people got more and more organized, and so the price is going up. But there is way to go. If we don't do something, there is way to go and spend more. So I think that Gordon Tallock was absolutely right. But the interesting thing is that Gordon Tallock implicitly, because the type of game he designed for this, is a game in which there is a benefit for society to put some limits. Sure. And uh, I actually enjoy in, in, in my book to pick a little bit on uh, Robert Barrow, because Robert Barrow defends restrictions in basketball and baseball, um, but not in everywhere else in the United <laughs> States. So uh, I don't understand why. In the United States, the only thing that is really non-competitive is sport. Uh, in Europe, the only thing that is really competitive is sport. Uh, in, in, uh, in Italy, uh, soccer, you have the first division, the second division, you are promoted or demoted according to performance. You don't buy your way into the NFL or the, the major league, etc. Here you buy the franchise and once you're in, no matter how sort of uh, uh, incompetent you are, you stay there, which is completely un-American. I'm very struck. <laughs> by your early work on business firms and hierarchy. Some of this is written with ragu. And the idea of introducing or reintroducing ideas of culture and governance and hierarchy into the business firm. And I wonder sometimes how much is this an Italian perspective? I'm sure you know Luigi Barzini's analysis of the multiplicity of masks in Italy. And sometimes the outsiders who think it's so freewheeling overlook these significant elements of hierarchy. Now the question I want to ask you is, these recent New York Times articles about Amazon and how Amazon either treated or allegedly treated its employees. Uh, the woman you know, took off a day to give birth to a child. The next day she was expected to come back in. All kinds of demands. People supposedly left the company crying. A lot of hierarchy uh, pay was pretty good. But given your analysis of the business firm and hierarchy, what's your take on this whole Amazon story? You think Amazon, those people are heroes, or this is inhumane, or we have the balance wrong? What do you say? I think that uh, probably we are, we're going a bit too much in a, in a certain direction. This is, uh, take also uh, Netflix. Apparently Netflix is sort of uh, as this credo that uh, we are a team, not a, not a family. And uh, like a team, we sort of uh, set aside everybody who sort of uh, is not up to being the first team. And uh, um, it works very well to motivate people. It's also quite uh, uh, sort of uh, hard for many of the people to work. And it's just, uh, uh, there is always the trade-off between incentive and some form of uh, insurance. And uh, if you eliminate every insurance, you have all incentives. The incentives are great, but people are not particularly happy, so you need to find the right trade-off. Uh, maybe it's how we get these scalable firms in the U.S. that Italy is somewhat lacking. 
by being I, harsher in some ways. I think that uh, I always said that the perfect world is a world in which you take uh, the best things from Italy and the best things from uh, the United States. <laughs> uh, my dream would be to live in Italy and walk in the States. Uh, the commuting is a bit complicated, <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, you're absolutely right. I think that. Uh, uh, you know, I come from a region in, in Italy where there are a lot of family firms. And, and what is extremely uh, moving and depressing in this moment is uh, in these firms, when they go bankrupt, uh, the owners commit suicide. There is a, a pretty sort of large number of suicide uh, today because unfortunately the business is not doing well. And sometimes they leave their life insurance to pay the salary of the employees. And then they, 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 com uh, they commit suicide. Uh, that's a completely orthogonal view of the firm, like really a family. And uh, now, which one is better depends on, on a lot of things. In a sense, depends on how much is important to transfer knowledge within the family. Uh, so uh, Italian firms are specialized, or used to be specialized, in uh, craftsmanship that uh, is hard to, to teach uh, unless you have a dedicated person transferring this. That's the reason why there were family firms, because you had the parents transfer to the kids. So a lot of uh, the education in Italy is done in the family. Uh, one of the best things about Italians, for example, is that they sit down at dinner. Uh, you say, why is so important? Uh, I thought that this was everybody sit down at dinner with a family. <laughs> um, I realized in America, a lot of people don't sit down at dinner. Actually, when I grew up, I sit down at lunch at dinner. Today is difficult because most people are not around at lunch. Sure. But there is a tradition of spending some time around the dinner table. And that's a place where you socialize, you learn, you transfer human capital from the older generation to the younger generation. I think that uh, this is one thing that uh, is lacking in, in the United States that they can learn from Italy. Now, you've written on conglomerates. One of the recent business stories is that Google will turn itself into a kind of conglomerate. The parent firm will be called Alphabet. Google will be one division. Will this matter, and if so, how? So I think it's not a bad idea for Google to separate the money-making machine from the rest. Uh, why? Because when you don't see how much transfer takes place, you tend to overdo it. So I think it's a first step to do the, this uh, uh, separation so that you see uh, from an accounting point of view who is making money and who is sort of uh, investing money or wasting money depending on the point of view. Won't it lower innovation by imposing more accountability or you think it's the opposite? Um, I think that uh, if innovation were just throwing money at it, um, Greece would be the most innovative country in the world, right? <laughs> so I think that uh, Money is a necessary condition, but uh, sometimes uh, it's not, actually, all the time it's not sufficient, and sometimes it's also counterproductive. I heard some young entrepreneurs saying, look, you don't want to get too much money early on because it distracted, doesn't keep you focused, etc." So I think it's very important to uh, uh, find where to invest the money. This is why markets are so important, because uh, we don't, we're not that good at it. Just, uh, I admit, I teach entrepreneurship, but if I were that good at picking the right investments, I would be a multi-billionaire, and I'm not. And it's, it's a difficult business to do. Uh, that's where the, the market is useful. And so my fear is that Google, especially because the governance of Google uh, resembles more the governance of Italian companies rather than the one of sort of uh, American companies. There's not sort of uh, a lot of uh, floating voting stock. The power is concentrated in the hands of few people. And as long as these few people are at the top of their game and they're smart and they are in the right sector at the right time, great. But uh, as we all know, people age, world change, and there will be a time in which they're not up to the game and they need to be replaced. And uh, at that time, the temptation for them to waste a lot of money would be pretty strong. Now, I'm going to try an exercise here. You know, I know I'm the interviewer, but I have a somewhat speculative bent as well. So you've worked in a lot of different areas, and I'm gonna to try to give my account of what I see as the underlying unities in your thought. So you have these papers, many more, a true stack would be higher, uh, and there's a lot of breadth there, but I think it is tied together, and I'll tell you how I see it as tied together, and you respond to that. How's okay, that? that sounds fantastic. There's maybe two or three ways of thinking about what you've done. So a lot of your main papers, they're about corporations or politics. 
So I read you as taking some core areas of economics and then pretty consistently suggesting that culture really matters and governance really matters and doing that consistently for businesses and government. But there's another way I, I think of what you're doing. This is maybe more Italian. So take the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci who wrote about hegemony and power and control. To me, you read like someone who read Gramsci at an early age, was quite struck by it, uh, maybe didn't agree with it, but you're taking all of his questions and re-asking them about control and hierarchy, but with real economics and with something like scientific method. So in both ways, you're quite this Italian thinker. You know, I have the saying, you know, all thinkers are regional thinkers. You just have to figure out what the region is. So you're redoing Gramsci with economics, or you're redoing economics with culture and governance. And then there's this other Gramscian dimension to your thought, that just as he thought, uh, he, he once said, you know, in, in the medium of the intellect, I am a pessimist. But when it comes to the medium of the will, I am an optimist. And there's this seesawing back and forth of the extreme pessimism and extreme optimism. And I, I, I see that in your work, too. You're an Italian who, who came to the U.S. with such high hopes. In, in many ways, you love it, but in other ways, you're deeply disappointed. And you keep on seeing the unities between U.S. and Italy, corporations and government, and the practical pessimism of this state of affairs. And yet you're propelled to do something about it you know, by writing, speaking, being a public figure, and so on. That would be like my two-minute version of who you are, what you do, and what do you say to that? It's fantastic. I wish I had <laughs> thought about it. No, seriously, I think that uh, it's very true. By the way, uh, the only thing that you probably miss is that this tension between the North and the South, yes. and is also Gramsci, is called a blocco storico, is the block that uh, ruled Italy for a long time, was this uh, alliance between the North, uh, Northern elite and the Southern elite, it was exactly Gramsci. So uh, I think that. Uh, you know, it's intellectual tradition also of Chicago. Stiegler, when he sort of uh, invented regulatory capture, was borrowing from Marx. Uh, it's sort of right-wing Marxism, right? <laughs> <clears throat> you told me you're a quarter Sicilian. What's the part of your thought that's quarter Sicilian? <laughs> I, I have a huge sense of pride, uh, which is not typical of my region. Uh, it's typical of Sicilian. Uh, you know, my grandfather was a military, but in his life he did three duels. Uh, we won them uh, all, but uh, <laughs> uh, th that was part of the culture of Sicily at the time. And, uh, and what is interesting, is a, a very interesting mechanism. If you are in the military and you are challenged to a duel, if you did it, you were punished. If you did not do it, you were demoted. <laughs> Which is the right way to think. You don't want to encourage something like this, but you don't want to encourage people to be coward. So it's, it's a, I thought it was a, it was a brilliant uh, system. And uh, so I think I have this, this element that uh, goes back to my Sicilian roots. Another Gramscian question, also an Italian question. In Europe, you're European, it seems to many of us there's some kind of line. And, and Gramsci asked, what's the difference between East and West? And where in Europe would you draw that line? And what from culture, what from governance, all the different areas of your, of your research, what determines that line? And why is, say, Macedonia in the situation it is right now, and southern France is not? It seems to have something to do with that line. Uh, it's very interesting, because uh, when I go to Istanbul, uh, I find it uh, part of uh, Europe in every sense, at least part of my world. I don't know whether I belong to Europe or not. It's all relative. But uh, Byzantium is so similar to Venice uh, that is impressive. And uh, so I feel completely at home in Istanbul. It's a, it's a bit Venice, a bit uh, Rome. So uh, how can you be sort of uh, feel different? I've never been to Macedonia. So, uh, but definitely, when you go to Moscow, you feel uh, it's a different world. Uh, so. Uh, it's interesting because uh, my notion of uh, uh, culture is probably more Mediterra Mediterranean than uh, East-West. So I feel uh, fairly at home in the Mediterranean. And I, I went actually to Iran before uh, the, uh, Obama reached the deal because <laughs> I'm an Italian citizen, so I could go to Iran without any problem. And uh, I was moved by how 
European, if you want. The, the, the Persian culture is very much linked to all the tradition in the, in the Mediterranean. And uh, so I don't feel it so much East. And, and by the way, Iranian people are super lovely people, and they're not anti-American. In fact, uh, you find more anti-American in France than you find in Iran. They, <laughs> they haven't seen us for so long, right? <laughs> I'm going to try an exercise I did with Jeff Sachs. I'm going to toss out a few terms, people's names, whatever, and just ask you, overrated or underrated? Mm -hmm. Okay? First one, campaign finance regulation. Overrated or underrated? Actually, paradoxically, overrated in the sense that uh, uh, capture takes a lot more subtle ways than just campaign financing. So it is an important consideration, but even if tomorrow we could fix that, I don't think would have fixed the capture problem. So overrated, okay. Angela Merkel, overrated or underrated? I think it's probably underrated. I, I'm impressed by her ability to, uh, number one, uh, run Europe for the interests of Germans uh, in a very effective <laughs> way. <laughs> you know, you, 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 should, you should be impressed. And so she's elected by German people. She has no European constituency. And so she does a job as a politician extremely well. Now, doesn't correspond to the interest of the rest of the Europeans, but that's a different. But the other thing that I'm impressed is how she handled the Im immigrant uh, sort of uh, crisis. And uh, we creating a positive feeling toward Germany uh, that was absent in Europe. And taking, I think, the right approach. Uh, we want refugees because refugees are the best people. Not only is a moral obligation to save people that escape uh, extermination, it's also an economic consideration. These are the most talented, the most entrepreneurial, uh, the most dynamic people in the world. We want to have them. But given your work on the persistence of culture, can Germany and Merkel absorb 800,000 Syrians a year for two or three years? Do you think so? I think that's a, an excellent question. I think that uh, this is something that is not discussed enough about immigration is uh, the process of assimilation. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, it's important to try to get immigrants that are more similar so that they assimilate faster, precisely to avoid those fractures that we've seen in the French uh, banlieue, in the suburbs of Paris, and so on and so forth. So I think that uh, probably uh, 800,000 people are, are what? Like uh, is, is less than 1% of... Uh, of Germany. But it's close to 1%. Yeah, it's close to 1%. I think in a year would be a lot. Uh, but it uh, depends on how fast they are in learning Germans. But you know, they already have a pretty good uh, Turkish population that is not perfectly integrated, but uh, they made them win the World Cup. So I think they're pretty uh, <laughs> high up in the sort of national uh, uh, respect and prestige. Pope Francis, overrated or underrated? I have to say, I love Pope Francis. I think he's, uh, I, it's hard to say he's underrated because everybody loves him, but uh, not being a Catholic, I've been raised Catholic, but I'm not a practicing Catholic by any stretch of the imagination, and I've been known to be an anti-clerical all my life. And I've been an anti-clerical because I really thought that the problem of Italy was that the church was there. And, and once I actually was discussing with a cardinal in Chicago, they said, no, no, the problem is the other way around. Is the problem the Vatican is the Vatican is in Italy. <laughs> and I, I, thought, I thought he was joking, but when they elected Pope Francis, I realized it was true. First of all, Pope Francis was elected basically by Northern and Southern American cardinals who were sick and tired of uh, the Italian mafia in the church. And, and they were sick and tired of why? Because they end up being sued here in the States and losing money in the States for responsibilities of the Vatican, and the Vatican did not chip in one dime. <laughs> not only that, it was wasting money with this IOR, Instituto Opera Religiose, that was a money laundering organization. Okay, this is something that should be dedicated to charity, was a money laundering organization. And Pope Francis is changing all this. And I, my only hope is that it's not killed. Uh, because I think that the chances of him being killed is not zero. Uh, and, uh, but he's fantastic. So Italy should elect someone from Argentina. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't go as far as that. I think, look, I don't think Argentina is the monopoly of a uh, good leader like, uh, and actually the tradition is not that in that direction. I'm just saying, Pope Francis is 
a fantastic leader, and I wish Italy had a leader like that. A related question from some of your research. Is Christianity good for economic growth? And if we look at those border areas of Africa, does it matter much for their future economies if they go Christian or Muslim? If I look at the data, I think that uh, uh, ma Muslim religion is not generally associated with uh, uh, good uh, attitudes for capitalism. Okay, and well, Muslim traders do very well around the world, right? Sure. Uh, the, it, I'm not saying that you can't be successful as being Muslim. What I'm saying, and, and I don't think that it is necessarily the Muslim religion per se, is uh, uh, the association of the way religion has been sort of uh, practiced and diffused in countries that are mostly Muslim. Uh, but, you know, I might be wrong on that because uh, I think Weber was wrong on the fact on saying that uh, sort of Catholicism is such a disaster. I think that uh, in a uh, Catholic country caught up fairly well. Uh, I think that uh, some of the Protestant ethics is useful to, in, in the system, but um, I don't think it's necessarily the major cause of uh, retardation uh, in, uh, in, in development. So um, I, I think is something you want to think about, but I don't think he's the major cause of underdevelopment around the world. Lucino Visconti, the Italian film director, overrated or underrated? Underrated. I think he's fantastic. I think that uh, but the best movie ever is The Leopard, uh, done by him. And uh, what's the social science <coughs> lesson in this movie? Uh, this, the, this, this story is a very sad story, but it's a very true story. It's a story of uh, the, the northern troops arriving in, in Sicily and, and liberating Sicily, and the nobility there saying we should change to remain the same. And so this ability of Italy, uh, which, by the way, I think has absorbed from the Catholic Church, who survived that long, is to change, not to change, to appear to change, to leave everything unchanged. And uh, it's really a desperation. But the movie is wonderful. There is a Claudia Cardinale out of this world, and uh, uh, Bart Lancaster and uh, Alain Delon, really a fantastic thing. And uh, I show it to my wife. She thinks it's slow, because last three hour and a half. It's not something that uh, uh, generally you have in Hollywood movies. But uh, uh, the quality of the scenes and uh, the quality of also the silences is out of this world. I once saw it on a big screen at American Film Institute. That was quite a help. Uh, it's a classic case where the movie was not worse than the book, you might say. Uh, that I think it's actually one of the few cases. I, I never read the book first and then saw a movie that I thought that the movie was the, the same level better, of the book. I, think, actually. I, I don't agree. I think they are the same level, uh, which for me is the only case I can mention. Mm -hmm. Beppe Grillo, is he actually funny? Yes. He is funny. So if yes. I understood Italian, I would laugh. Yeah, and it's just, it has some foul jokes, but most sort of comedians have. I think that uh, uh, certainly more funny than Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Is he funnier than you? Uh, <laughs> definitely. I, I, no, uh, look, uh, there is one thing you have to realize about Beppe Grillo. Uh, first of all, he has a uh, sort of degree in accounting, okay, which First of all, it's not normal for a comedian. Uh, accountants generally are not that funny. Uh, but second, makes him more qualified than most people to actually, uh, certainly most comedians, to read uh, income statements and balance sheets. And uh, he started, before he even was a politician, he started being kind of an um, agitator in shareholders' meeting and going to shareholders' meeting with one share and started to ask questions and pose sort of uh, problems in uh, Italian corporate governance. And uh, was very successful, at least at raising the level of awareness. Uh, so in that sense, he, he did something very, very valuable. No co-authors, no colleagues, but who's the most underrated living economist? Ooh, uh, this, is, uh, and why? this is a very, uh, very difficult question. Who is the most? Uh, I would have said Gordon Tallock. I, I did not just pass away. Uh, I think that, uh, um, I think he was really underrated for what he did. Around here, we'll, we'll grant you that. Now, how would you say your opinions have changed in the last seven to 10 years? An awful lot has happened in the world. The EU has not turned out the way a lot of people thought. There's a lot more opposition to migration. We've had a financial crisis. We may be on the verge, possibly, of another global recession because of China. Italy 
possibly or probably hasn't turned things around. So over the course of the last 10 years, how have your views changed? I don't mean on particulars, but at the conceptual level. Uh, I think that uh, I got much more interested in uh, monetary problems. In a sense, uh, I, ironically, when I started, I started uh, study economics because I grew up in a country with a double-digit inflation, so I thought that that was a big problem. Um, but then, by the time I became an economist, inflation was not an issue, and uh, I thought that was not particularly interesting. Now, all this issue of deflation, how to fight deflation, is deflation a problem? I think that uh, are topics that 10 years ago I would be completely ignorant about, and now I'm fascinated by Now you think they're very important. Yes. You find it striking that the world's three main currencies all have interest rates of zero. Yeah, it is striking. And, and uh, uh, I am torn because there is a part of me that say that uh, this zero interest rate policy is a redistribution in the wrong direction. It's just taking away from uh, the people who, with a bank deposit and give it to sort of uh, the guys who can uh, easily uh, engage in speculation, etc. So from, from a sort of uh, moral point of view, I think the redistribution goes in the wrong direction. On the other hand, I sort of have seen uh, the European, uh, the Eurozone fall slowly into, into deflation uh, for a sort of six months last year we're in the deflation range. And this maybe is my Italian heart bleeding, but when you have a huge amount of uh, debt and you start to have a deflation, uh, Ivan Fisher was right. The debt deflation spiral is pretty terrible. And uh, that's probably the worst possible outcome. And, uh, and I think that uh, uh, generals are famous to be prepared to fight the last war, and uh, so are economists and central bankers. So the, the ECB, has, set, has been set up to fight inflation. And so it's completely non prepared to think in those terms. In fact, I will raise this challenge because when the European leaders talk, they say that, oh, our objective is an inflation below but close to 2%. And I look for a statement of this type. If you look in the sort of uh, web page of the ECB, they say that they want inflation below 2%, so there's no close, it's below 2%, where, the, where inflation is measured as the harmonics price index at the European level. And then they want every individual CPI of every country below but close to 2%. Now, if you have an average and every term must be below 2, uh, <laughs> even if close to 2, the average must be below two by probably by a lot. I think and so, so uh, I think that uh, the ECB has been designed basically to have deflation. And uh, I don't think they're mentally prepared to how to deal in this situation. And I think that that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big issue. I'm also struck by some of your work on behavioral economics. I like very much the paper where you take some investors and instead of showing them Visconti's The Leopard, you show them a horror movie, and you see what happens to the risk premium. But there's another paper I want to ask you about. It's about impatience and procrastination. That is, it's often the case, the same people who are very impatient then procrastinate, and you give the example of people who are very impatient to get a check. They'll even settle for a much smaller sum of money to get the check now. But then they get the check, and they don't cash it or spend it or do anything with it. They get it, and then they procrastinate. What's the, the underlying view or model of human behavior that causes impatience and procrastination to go together? Oh, you're setting me uh, for a very low standard, right? A model that in, in, uh, uh, I don't think I have a model that includes everything. And, and this is part of a larger experiment, which to some extent is still undergoing, where with a colleague at Northwestern, we, we sort of uh, study an entire cohort of MBA students at Chicago, 550 people. And many experiments that are done around the world are done with uh, undergrad, and most of them are the poorest undergrad because they're the ones that sort of desperately need money, so a generally art major. Uh, so not really representative <laughs> of business people. And so a lot of people in economics dismiss some of these results because they say, oh, these are the weird guys. They're not the one that will run big corporation, blah, blah, blah. So we started with a sample that 
hopefully will run big corporation, statistically has run big corporation. And what we find in many of the deviations that uh, behavioral economics find uh, are present in our sample. Uh, and so the particular uh, experiment that Tyler is talking about is at the end of a bunch of games that won an amount of money that was going from zero to $300. So some people were winning sort of a significant amount of money, $300. We offer them to delay the delivery uh, to, by two weeks. And with the values interest rate, in some cases, at 10% over two weeks. So 10% over two weeks, over $300 is both percentage-wise huge, but even sort of nominal, $30 is sort of uh, not trivial. Uh, at least for me, maybe for my students is, is more important. But so these guys uh, really give up receiving $30 over two weeks to get the check in the mail that day. However, this is the only clever thing we've done in, in that particular study is we follow when they cash the check. And on average, it was two weeks, but 10% never cash it. They lost it. <laughs> so they are so eager to get the stuff. But then, uh, and, and I think that uh, if I had to give a sense, is the salience of, of this. So um, honestly, these people, everybody should have accepted uh, delay uh, payment because we check 90% of them were not maxed out in their credit card. So what it means receiving a gift in cash, actually a check, is not even a gift in check today over two, over two weeks. Uh, once you know you have received it, uh, we think we were fairly credible as a faculty promising. So I think the credibility issue was not a major. If you know that you won $300, uh, you can go and spend it today on your credit card and get the check two weeks from now. The fact that you want to have it now I think is an interesting aspect about saliency. And the fact that uh, once you have it, you relax and you forgot to, to check it, to cash it, is I think pretty interesting by itself. Speaking of procrastination and impatience, what's your view on the future of the European Union? It, it seems to me it cannot fully integrate, because unlike with North and South Italy, there you actually have a fully integrated electorate, right? You have a single set of elections where you choose a national leader and everyone more or less accepts it. It's very hard for me to see that for Europe. So I suppose my expectation will be that the ties become weaker and weaker, Schengen falls away, there's not a fiscal union, the euro becomes a bit more like a currency board, national central banks keep certain kinds of liabilities. But what's your prediction for, say, 20 years from now? European integration, more of it, less of it, and what, what's the underlying model? So, uh, quoting Gramsci, let's first give sort of a, the pessimistic rational view is that there would be a, a, a breakup between the Northern Europe and the Southern Europe. Uh, the, the wishful thinking, uh, or no, the wishful thinking is too bad, is the optimism of, well, the, the desire to make a change. And that's what uh, I think every uh, sensible human being should be working for, is to try to actually make the European project a, democrat, a democratic pro process. So uh, something European that people actually electorate. will vote uh, somebody that can decide something. Because we elect a parliament that is not the real power to appoint a prime minister, to appoint somebody, and nobody really responds to the European people. Of course. So I think that uh, uh, an in injection of democracy is what is most needed, and hopefully all the tension uh, will emerge. If you want to be optimistic, uh, like I want to be, uh, the United States did not have an easy route. And as I said at the beginning, there was a lot of tension and uh, there was a civil war. So in order to, uh, hopefully in Europe we're already for the civil war too, uh, in, in the last century. So uh, we don't want any more of that. But the fact that the process is not linear, I think is inevitable. The fact that there are tensions and bumps is inevitable. The important thing is at least you see the right direction. And this is what sometimes I'm not so sure that everybody sees. And I think the right direction is more democracy. Last question before we open up to the crowd. You're now director of the Stigler Center at Chicago, and you've studied organizations for your whole career. Given what you've learned, uh, we're here, of course, at the Mercatus Center hosting this event. But how will this shape what you will do with the Stigler Center as an economist? 
So uh, I think that uh, the first thing is spend time in hiring the best possible people. Uh, I think that uh, one thing that works well in university is that we spend a huge amount of time selecting faculty. Uh, it's a lot of what we do is listening to seminar, reading papers, refereeing papers, selecting the next generation. And what I've learned in various organizations is the best, most successful organization are the one that spend a huge amount of time sort of selecting the good people uh, because uh, it's very costly to fire. You don't want to fire uh, unless you have to. And uh, once you get the right people in place, uh, organization I wouldn't say run themselves, but almost. And if you don't have the right people in place, uh, you spend a lot of time fixing the hiring mistakes. There's now a little bit of time for questions. Please, questions, not statements. Go up to the mic. We will alternate how we call on you. Uh, how many minutes are left? Ten minutes? Okay. Uh, first, if you make a long statement, I'll just cut you off. Uh, this is for <laughs> our guests to answer. First question, yes. Thank you very much for coming. My name is David Willey. I'm a research uh, assistant with the Mercatus Center. Uh, part of our research is um, looking at the connection between the financial services industry and small business creation. And uh, as you know, on a number of measures, you know, small business creation is down. Innovation seems to be down in the U.S. What, in your view, is the connection, if any, between the financial services industry and the problems in that industry and uh, the decline in innovation, the decline of new business creation in the U.S.? Thank you. So I think that uh, uh, the role that the financial sector has in, uh, in promoting uh, new businesses, innovation, and, and it's also small business is, is crucial. Uh, and that's much of a, uh, the first book with Wagyu was dedicated precisely to celebrate this role. Uh, now, do they succeed always so well? And the answer is, is no, because there are some, some frictions. Ironically, there was a period, I don't think we're there anymore, but it was a period in which uh, uh, venture capitalists were so much flooded with money that they had to sort of uh, dish out this money uh, sufficiently fast that they had to shell it out in big pieces. So they were only financing more advanced companies because they couldn't find the time to actually uh, shell it out in small pieces at the time. Uh, so it's very important that you have capital in the right people to, uh, to do that. If I were to point out the major problem to financial innovation today in the United States are not the financial system. In other countries, I, I would think it's financial system. In Italy, clearly the financial system. In the United States, it's not. It's more sort of a patent policy and other form of bias to entry. Um, one story that I tell in my book that really motivated me to write the book is when I got approached by some uh, students that were trying to start a, a company, and the first thing that they had devised was basically a lobbying plan. Uh, and I said, if the first thing, the part of the business plan is the lobbying plan, then we have a problem in America. Over here, question. Uh, Frank Mannheim, School of uh, Government Policy and International Affairs, right here. I wonder if you have taken a look or compared the uh, environmental regulatory policies in Europe with those in the United States, uh, which are in quite a bit of debate right now, and what your thoughts about the comparisons might be. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I have not looked at that. I think that uh, your idea is, is extremely good uh, to make the comparison to see also which lobbies are winning the game. Because uh, my bet is that the differences in regulation are driven entirely by who are the most influential groups across the board. So um, I was talking to some farmer in Italy that was saying uh, in uh, regulation of how much, um, uh, how could it's called, not copper, what you give on the vineyard to, um, there is a yeah, copper-based stuff that you put on the, on the, on the vineyard to uh, prevent some diseases. There is some regulation. Uh, there is only one exemption in Europe, and it is uh, uh, for the plant, now it escapes the name, would you make the beer? Uh, because the Germans wanted to make sure that you could produce sort of uh, enough of that to produce the beer. So uh, regulation, unfortunately, not just in the United States, but also in Europe, is, is driven by this uh, special interest. So I think it would be a very nice comparison to do. Next question. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Alexander Skouris uh, from the Atlas Network. I'm from Greece, so that's what I'm, uh, that's what I'm about to ask you about. Please don't laugh. <laughs> um, I know that you have been following uh, what's going on in Greece and in other European countries as well very closely. Uh, the question is very simple. Uh, given the, current, the new agreement that uh, the, the European Union signed with Greece, uh, is there anything or any under conditions you would see something good coming out of it? Uh, and second part, uh, what can Greece can do in order to get out of the crisis if we forget about the debt negotiation, which we must assume that it's going to take place somewhere sometime soon? Yeah, so the, the, the big hope is that eventually there will be some debt forgiveness in some form that uh, is not called debt forgiveness, but is delay of payment to infinity that is not amount of debt, <laughs> debt forgiveness. Um, that's, that's, uh, you know, the, uh, this is why politics is so hard, because as an economist, you call a spade a spade, and uh, uh, if you sort of uh, forgive in present value, is that forgiveness? But in politics, it's very different. Um, so I think that, that uh, that's, that's the hope. And uh, the big fear that I have is uh, the political backlash that we have seen with the rise of uh, Syriza. Now Syriza has been uh, uh, sort of uh, tamed and made part of the European elite. All of a sudden, all the uh, newspapers in Europe are celebrating how great is Cyprus, the same guy that until yesterday was sort of... Uh, a, a communist, a revolutionary, a dangerous, now is sort of part of the European team. Why? Because a sign on the dotted line, whatever they told him to sign. Um, so I, the, the, my frustration is I agree with a lot of the reforms that the, the European Union is imposing on Greece. I think that uh, longer term would probably benefit Greece. But I am a democratic at heart, and I think that the reforms you should own them. This should not be imposed on you. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, inevitably, uh, the northern uh, countries are trying to do with Greece what the northern Italy did with southern Italy. They're trying to, not to fix Greece, but to minimize the problem for Europe. So nobody really uh, in Brussels, except maybe uh, the, the, the Greek uh, representative, care about Greece and Greek people. They care about stability in the EU and uh, getting that problem off their agenda. Exactly like uh, in Turin, people did not care about people in Sicily. They care that the revolt would be uh, sedated. And uh, they did whatever it takes to sedate the revolt, uh, including, by the way, aligning with the mafia. One of the reasons why the mafia is alive and well is because it was a method of control of Sicily that uh, the uh, northern army used very effectively. And the long-term costs are, are huge. Now, I'm not saying that uh, uh, the European Union is helping the Greek mafia, but I wouldn't uh, sort of uh, <laughs> exclude it. Uh, I wouldn't exclude it. Uh, also because uh, the people that best uh, can negotiate with the European Union in Greece are part of the Greek elite. The people who speak English, uh, travel abroad, are part of the very elite that run the country up to now into the grounds. Uh, corrupt, crony, and, uh, and every negative thing that you want to say. And why do you expect these guys all of a sudden to change just because they're blessed by the European Union? I don't think that that's, that's the case. So, I think that uh, uh, I uh, thought that the uh, so-called bailout of Greece in 2010 was a, a disaster, was really a bailout of French and German banks, uh, uh, sort of covered with the pretense of helping Greece. Uh, and I think that uh, since then, we have not recovered from that mistake. So I think that that's, that's a really uh, sour spot on, uh, in, the, in the European history and, and something that will uh, weigh very heavily in the future. We have time for just a final, very quick question and quick answer. Next, please. Hi, my name is Stephen Jones. I'm an MA fellow at Mercatus, and I do have a quick question, which is, in your little vignette at the beginning, you noted that uh, the cafe shop workers are so unbelievably productive. And I'm just wondering why you would want somebody to be that productive in a cafe. 
Um, is it because Italians value coffee that more, or maybe labor regulations, or, or something else entirely? So we come back full circle to Italy. <laughs> Luigi. Uh, you actually uh, raise an excellent point. Uh, my wife, who's American, uh, walked into a, a auto grill in Italy, and she's amazed by the fact that the guy speaks perfect English. Uh, she said, much better than yours. And, uh, <laughs> and she, sort of, uh, she discovered that this guy has a university degree and, uh, in uh, English literature, and he was serving coffee uh, at the auto grill. I think that uh, that's pretty depressing. Uh, I think that, that that's maybe the reason why Italian cafe are so good, is because sort of uh, uh, there are no other opportunities. I, uh, actually, uh, I have this line, again, comparing the United States and Italy, I, I notice uh, that in Italy, uh, on average, uh, like the personal assistants are great, are really fantastic. And managers are not that good. <laughs> and, and so I said, wait a minute, why is that the case? Oh, obvious, because the market doesn't work. And if, you, if you don't sort out the market, you can have some very talented people doing jobs that generally don't require the talent. And you have, unfortunately, non-talented people doing jobs that require a lot of talent. So my favorite line that made did not make me very popular in Italy. Italy is the country with the best secretaries and the worst managers. On that, three announcements to close. First, big round of thanks for Luigi. Next, September 24th, is Danny Roderick. And finally, Luigi will be outside signing books. He has three books. Any book you bring, he will sign. Luigi, thank you again. A great honor and pleasure, My pleasure. to have you. Pleasure.